Education of Podcast. Today is Monday, April 18, 2022. I am Rifat Mandan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend, Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome Dr. Franz Vogt, who is Professor of Pathology at Perelman School of Medicine in Pennsylvania. And he is also the chair of the Department of Pathology at Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. And uh, today he is going to give a talk on ophthalmic pathology. And the title of today's talk is going to be Introduction to Ophthalmic Pathology. As always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on both YouTube and Facebook chat windows. And we will pass those questions to Dr. Folk at the end of the talk. And thank you, Dr. Folk, for joining us today. Over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me for this um, talk. And I would like to uh, start with ophthalmic pathology at the outset. What happens is that when I started to do ophthalmic pathology in about 2002, that about 86% of cases which were shown in our yearly meetings were globes. So uh, uh, exenterated eyes for tumors and lesions. And this is really not the case anymore. Uh, many of the tumors are being treated locally, uh, are radiated, and the number of adult eyes we receive for tumors has gone down therefore very significantly. What I want to do is to give you some introduction into ophthalmic pathology with material that pathologists, surgical pathologists can encounter every day and potentially should be able to sign out or at least have an idea what uh, the lesion is about. So let me change to my microscope and show you a couple of slides with what I want to start. Dr. Fogg, you can turn off our video if you don't mind. Okay. Thank you. I have to find out how to do that. So one second, please. So this is what we do. Yeah, we are good. Okay, can you see my, can you see my microscope screen? Yes, thank you. So a very frequent biopsy we are receiving is that of a temporal artery. And I want to make sure that you are aware of the histology of a normal temporal artery. We go quickly through it so that we can go to the diseases we associate with temporal artery. So we have here a cross section of a medium sized muscular artery. You see the media here. We have here the intima and surrounding we have the adventitia. And you see there is no inflammatory infiltrate. And this is a normal temporal artery biopsy. We always cut them in these slices so we can see as many, as much surface as possible from the material we receive. And we are getting approximately six slides with many of these ribbons on it, because temporal arteriitis can be, um, can have skip lesions, and we want to make sure that we discover those. What we can frequently see in elderly patients is that we have these calcifications in the wall, and they should not be mistaken for a temporal arteriitis. This is arteriosclerosis involving the temporal artery, but this is not a disease that should be treated with high concentration of steroids. So let me show you an artery as an example here, where we have temporal arteriitis. So you see here the residual artery, and you see here the residual lumen. And remember, when you decrease the radius of a, of a cylinder by one half, the resulting volume that goes through the cylinder 
if the pressure remains the same, is a 16th, according to that hardened Poisson law. So you can imagine that very little blood is going to reach the areas distal to that stenosis. And what we have here is a granuloma formation. We see here areas of giant cells, and we see here areas of inflammation. So this would be a specimen that has temporal arteritis, in that case, uh, consistent with giant cell arteritis. Sometimes, and that shouldn't happen too frequently, it happens that a temporal artery is being submitted after a patient has been treated. This patient has been treated for a presumptive temporal arteritis, and you see it is very difficult to make a statement here. We have again a muscularis, and we have a very prominent intima with artifacts here. We don't have any giant cells, so it's difficult to say had, did the patient have a temporal arteritis or not. And we can only try to be helpful here. What I did here is I stained the area for CD68. And one can see that there are some macrophages within the wall of the artery. And I also stained with CD3. And I could see that there were very few cells within the wall and in the adventitia. Uh, that is all I could report here. I can say it is compatible with a treated temporal arteritis, but this lesion was not adequate for a diagnosis, and therefore that was a bit of a problem, but it couldn't be solved differently. So let me go to the presentation. And oh, what, what, what I wanted to say on that presentation is I'm using here some of the picture material from Alan Proya, who is in North Carolina. And he made those uh, available to a teaching uh, he did many years ago. And he specifically stated that the material can be used for ongoing teaching. So some of the material I'm using from him. So uh, when we go about temporal arteritis, uh, giant cell arteritis, that is the most common systemic vasculitis in North America. One can see granulomatous inflammation, which is chiefly in the extracranial portion of the carotid artery. So there are people who say that this may be associated with the lamina elastica, which is not present when the artery enters beyond the meninges. Whether this is really the case that the lamina elastica is part of the elements that elicit the temporal arteritis is however not clear. The disease manifests after age 50 typically with headache, polymyalgia, rheumatica, claw jodication and visual loss. The, the erythrocyte uh, sedimentation rate is very high and the CRP level is high. Again, the complication is, is either a temporal reversible blindness or a blindness. So the reversible one is called amaurosis fugax. Very important is early treatment and early diagnosis and tapering of prednisone after two to four weeks. What we do is we typically treat patients right after the biopsy is being done. And then the next day a biopsy will be available and then if it is negative, the case patient can be tapered out of prednisone very fast. Again, the normal artery with the muscularis and the intima. Sometimes you receive them broken, but these are mostly artifacts which are received through the surgery. And these are different cases of temporal arteritis. The inflammation often is in the media, doesn't have to be, Sometimes it's just in the adventitia and goes slowly into the media. In other areas here, we see a broad infiltrate with inflammation and in these giant cells directly under the intima. In the longitudinal sections, which you should usually not get, 
sometimes we get it, but it's not a good way of preparing a temporal artery. You see here the peri the perivascular adventitial infiltrate with some percolating of cells into the media. A different case here with giant cells. And again, another case, just so that you can see a couple of examples of temporal arteriitis. The differential diagnosis is of course, treated arteria, uh, temporal arteriitis as I showed you and calcific changes in the artery. So for example, here, calcific changes in the artery. Again, another case, don't mix that up with temporal arteriitis. And here that is the same case, which I just showed you, that is a treated case of temporal arteriitis. So before we go now on, let me give you a little the anatomy of the eye, and then we are going to look at that anatomy of the eye under the microscope. So the light is coming from right to the left. It passes through the cornea. We have the anterior chamber with the angle. The iris leaves open the pupil, behind of which is the lens, the ciliary apparatus, and then the retina starts with the optic nerve at the end. And the layers are beyond the retina would be the choroid and the sclera. And let's look at that under the microscope. So we have here an eye, and you see this, the light comes from here. We have here the cornea, the lens, the iris, the ciliary apparatus here, then the retina develops, and here we get into the nerve. Let's be a bit more on the higher power here. So the top layer of the cornea are about five, four to five, maybe six layers of non-keratinizing squamous epithelium. And right under it is the Bowman membrane, this right here. And what you can see here is this stroma here, which has these holes. And it looks almost like a basket weave here, as, as if you have a thick basket weave. And this is an artifact that is caused by the fixation and the preparation of the specimen. And this is how it should look. If this basket weave disappears and you get a homogeneous area, then you have to entertain the differential diagnosis of a stromal edema, which is of course abnormal. At the inside of the cornea, you will see the decianate membrane. And the decianate membrane is lined on the inner side by an endothelial layer, a single endothelial layer of endothelium. When we go back into lower power, we see that the cornea ends on the inside here in an angle. And the angle shows here the canal of Schlem through which the equus will leave through the meshwork here into the canal of Schlem. The posterior border is the iris. The iris has on the anterior aspect, no epithelium. There is no epithelium at the anterior aspect of the iris. The posterior aspect has a double layer of thick pigmented epithelium. Double layer of pigmented epithelium. There's a circular muscle to open and close the pupilla. And you see that the vessels which are within the area of the iris are very thin and sparse. The double layer of the pigmented epithelium of the iris at the posterior aspect now changes into a still double layer, but here the inner layer is non-pigmented and the outer layer is pigmented. So at the area of the ciliary apparatus, this here is the ciliary apparatus with smooth muscle under it here, this area changes the double layer epithelium from double pigmented to pigmented, non-pigmented. 
right on top of it, we see the lens. The lens is encapsulated. It is the thicket membrane, as far as I know, the body can build. This is the, mem the, this is the lens membrane, the men lens capsule. And under it is the epithelium that produces the lens capsule material. This epithelium is present up to the side of the lens. It is not present posterior. The lens typically does not contain any nuclei. Uh, some air, sometimes nuclei are either retained or are still there, but in a, in a normal lens, you should not see nuclei. Ciliary apparatus again, and then there is the transition into the retina. And here we have now the retina with the ganglion cell layer, the inner and outer nuclear layer, the reticular layer, inner and outer reticular layer, and then at the bottom here, the light receptors. The retina lays on top of the pigmented retinal epithelium, and the pigmented retinal epithelium lays on top of Bruch's membrane. Under the Bruch's membrane is the vascular structure, the choroid, that also contains uh, that also contains cells which have melanin, melanin producing cells. These here are the cells that produce a melanoma if there is a uveal melanoma. And then we have here on the outside the sclera. And here we have the nerve, the optic nerve here with a vein and the artery in it. You can imagine that both occlusion of vein or artery with vessels of that size will immediately lead to vision loss. So this is the eye in short. And what I would like to show you, let me change to my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, that's not right. Again, we have the, the normal cornea. We have here the epithelium, Bowman's membrane, stroma, Deschamps membrane, and endothelium. This is a very frequent lesion that we can encounter as pathologists. You see here growth of very well vascularized uh, conjunctival epithelium onto the cornea. This lesion is called a pterygium. And what you can see in a pterygium is surface epithelium. Underlying the surface epithelium, you see soft tissue with prominent vessels and degenerated epithelium. It's basically uh, solar elastosis in that area of the collagen deposition here. This material very often calcifies and calcification is one of the hallmarks of a pterygium. The surface epithelium is squamous with more like here or fewer uh, goblet cells, which are part of the normal conjunctiva. If I show you that on the microscope, okay. then I show you here, a soft fragment of soft tissue lined by squamous epithelium with some areas showing goblet cells here and here and here, which are normal in the conjunctiva. The underlying soft tissue is well vascularized and it shows degenerated collagen, which has really the look of what you can see in solar elastosis. This material here is not calcified but it's still a pterygium. 
it's a very clinical diagnosis, of course. Let me show you another couple of lesions which we can encounter in the cornea. So what we have here in this cornea, we have much of the cornea missing. We have here a cross section and one can see here the rest of the decimates membrane. So we know here is the anterior chamber and this here must be the outside. And what we have here is an ulceration and a very significant inflammatory infiltrate. This is an infiltrate. This infiltrate has been cultured and this was a fungal infiltrate. And this was an infiltrate of a Fusarium species. And I show you another one with a Candida species, which is easier to recognize. We have two sections here. Yeah, two sections here. We see again in the PAS stain here, the decimates membrane. And we have here within, within the cornea, we have the accumulation of yeast forms. This is a candida keratitis. Another patient I have here is a patient who had contact lenses and developed an ulcer under the contact lens. And here you can see a little more. This is a bit of a pale slide, but we have to make through it. One doesn't see those very frequently. We have a squamous epithelium on top, which did not look as innocent as the one I showed you from the normal eye. We have here almost it starts to keratinize a little. Under the, under the epithelium, we see the formation of vessels. The formation of vessels in the cornea is called chronic keratitis. And then we see that there's acute inflammation as well, lots of acute inflammation. And then we see these, then we see these structures here. These are amoebic structures, acant amoeba, typically seen in these cases of patients who have changes with contact lens varying. Acant amoeba, important to recognize. In, uh, immune immu in norm normal Im uh, immune functioning patients, it would be uh, restricted to the cornea and would not go into either the anterior or the posterior change, uh, chamber. And that could be different in patients who are immunocompromised. Let me show you now another, let's see what we have here on the, on the PowerPoint. So what can happen in the cornea is that the cornea undergoes damage uh, according to genetic disorders, which lead either to buildup of abnormal material or changes in the epithelium, stroma, or endothelium. And I want to show you two important cases which you could potentially see in your practice. The first one, is Fuchs dystrophy. And I show you again on the picture afterwards. What you can see here is again a cornea with epithelium, Bowman membrane, stroma. And you see the stroma does not have the mice basket we showed before. This is much more dense. This is stromal edema. Under the stromal edema, a very thick decimates membrane and endothelium in areas missing. So what you can see here in an area where it is not as thick, for example, here, you can see these kind of excrescences. They look like a, a drop. And therefore, this is, these structures are called butata. What happens in these 
in this disease, in Fuchs dystrophy, is that there is a genetic damage to the endothelium, which produces towards of the end of a shortened life, a large amount of basement membrane material in the form of these drops, but here it's much more confluent. That absence of the endothelium that develops leads to entry of water into the stroma, which is not being emptied out by the, by the pump that is usually associated with the endothelium. So the patient will develop stromal edema and that stromal edema will also lead, let's see whether we have one here, yeah, a bit here, not too much, will also lead to a dehiscence of the surface epithelium from the Bowman membrane. And that is called a bulla formation. And there, of course, one cannot look through this and focus. So these corneas need to be replaced. What they do these days is the uh, corneal surgeons will only take out the lower part of the cornea, this part, the upper part, the outer part will stay, and they will replace only the inner part of the cornea, which will be aligned to the half of the cornea that is being left. The uh, surgeons are very skilled in doing that. That would be a Fuchs dystrophy. Another kind of dystrophy that can happen in patients is that there can be the deposition of material in the cornea, which is abnormal. And you see here in this cornea, there is material within the stroma here, which is abnormal. It's slightly pink. And I show you this material in a Congo red stain. And it is positive for Congo red and nicely apple green. This is, this is the nicest apple green one can imagine, I guess. And that is also a form of dystrophy, which we are going to discuss in one minute. So we have talked about Fuchs dystrophy and about the dystrophy with the amyloid. So there are a lot of dystrophies which are very specific and I'm not going through those, but you see, I've just put down the, uh, the list of corneal dystrophies, but this, this is very specific and that will not be part of a normal surgical pathologists daily work. So the Fuchs dystrophy, as I said before, is a inherited disorder in the fifth or sixth decade, typically with endothelial da damage that results in corneal edema and bullous keratopathy. So the bulla formation between the endo epi epithelium and the Bowman membrane. And the corneal damage is caused by a primary dystrophy of the corneal endothelium. So again, we have the epithelium here, Bowman membrane, we have the stroma with edema, and we have here the guttata formation. These drops here, this is guttata formation. Again here, these drops are guttata formation, and this is a normal, a normal decimet, it's norm, normal decimet membrane as a comparison. And a raster electronic picture would show these kind of depositions on the inside of the cornea. The bulla formation here is the loosening of the epithelium from the Bowman membrane. And the other case I showed you with the amyloid deposition, this is the side view you can see on a patient who has amyloid deposition. These irregular scratches on the top of the, of the cornea, and they are positive for amyloid stain. So these kind of dystrophies with amyloid are called lattice dystrophies. And they, there used to be a whole group of different lattice dystrophies, but they have not now been put together more or less as to one big group. So there are primary amyloidosis of the cornea with no other involvement of the body. Then there is systemic amyloidosis, for example, the familial amyloidotic polyneuropathy, 
that can also involve the cornea. Then there is the possibility that amyloid develops in patients who have chronic corneal diseases, such as trichiasis, trachoma, leprosy, sarcoidosis. And then there is secondary systemic amyloidosis, so patients who have tuberculosis, for example, but that does not affect the cornea. Either of the primary dystrophies can recur when a corneal transplant has been performed. So let's now go to the area of the, um, of the iris, ciliary apparatus and choroid, which is the uvea. So as I showed you before, the iris has a double layer of pigmented epithelium, a muscle, and the anterior aspect shows small amount of vessels. This is normal. One can see abnormal iris in which the double layered epithelium is being seen at the anterior aspect of the iris as well. And that can be seen in patients who have uh, glaucomas, in patients who have any kind of ischemias, and in patients who have diabetes. And there, in diabetes, for example, you can also see that this, the vasculature, which here is very wispy, gets very thick and round, and this is called rubiosis of the iris. So this is called ectropion uvae, when the, when the epithelium of the iris goes on the anterior aspect, and the thickening of the vessels typically seen in diabetes would be called rubiosis of the iris. As I said, the ciliary apparatus, the ciliary apparatus shows muscle layer under it. So there can be lyomyomas, schwannomas, ciliary body adenomas, and meduloepitheliomas. They can develop here. And I show you that in specific. So what I want to show you here is that these kind of lesions can be seen from the outside sometimes. You see here, that is a not so good photo. And you see here is the typical red reflection of a, of a photography where the flash is too close to the lens. So you see here the red reflection of the normal eye, but you see here a white reflection. And the white reflection is abnormal. That is called leukochoria. And that is somebody who de detected that kind of a lesion on a photo and, you know, it was worth a headline. So let me talk to you about a meduloepithelioma. I will talk first on the PowerPoint presentation and then I show you a case in the, on the glass slides. So a meduloepithelioma is a congenital tumor of the non-pigmented ciliary epithelium. So you do remember that there were the two layers the inner one, which is non-pigmented, and the outer one, which is pigmented. The, this area develops from the optic cup, which is an outgrowth of the medullary epithelium, and I show you a picture in that. At six weeks of gestation, the inner and the outer wall of the optic cup look the same, and they are called the embry embryonal retina. Then the anterior portion of the optic cup eventually goes on to form the epithelium of the iris and the ciliary body. And from there, this tumor develops. So if we go here, we have the, we have the surface ectoderm, the lens vesicle grows in, and we have here the inner and the outer optic cup. And from this area here, from the inner optic cup, this tumor develops. And so we have here a patient, see here a young patient, these are usually diagnosed at the time of birth, has a tumor here in the eyeball. And the tumor is located then oriented the same way. So the tumor is approximately in this area and then opened. And we have here the tumor, so it's probably here upside down. Here we have the tumor. 
And you see here part of the ciliary apparatus. And here we get into the area of this tumor. This area does have and show a little of the cells that represent the non-pigmented ciliary, uh, the non-pigmented epithelium of the ciliary apparatus. But then in other areas, one can see these irregular blastine kind immature neural elements. And importantly, these tumors can have heterologous elements. These tumors can be either benign or malignant. And typically sarcomatoid differentiation, mitotic forms and invasion will make the diagnosis whether the lesion is malignant or benign. The histologic criteria for malignancy are poor, uh, poorly differentiated neuroblastic cells, pleomorphism, sarcomatous appearance of the stroma, and tumor invasion of the uvea. So let me show you a case here on the bio, on a on a teaching case. This teaching case does not have heterologous elements, but you can see here a tumor. And here, to make that diagnosis, it's really location, location, location. This is a tumor that develops at the ciliary apparatus. And you can see here this irregular, this irregular immature neural elements. And you see here this malignant case here has a lot of mitotic forms. It does not have the typical homoright rosettes or the fleurets one can see in retinoblastoma. And it also doesn't have the prominent calcification one can see in retinoblastoma. It also doesn't have the significant necrosis one can see in retinoblastoma. So this would here be the picture of a um, of a medulloepithelioma of the of the ciliary apparatus, which really has has nothing to do with the medulla epithelioma of the cerebellum. It's just the same name. So let's talk about the lens. So we have the lens is uh, behind the iris and the lens can produce the very thick membrane, which I capsule, which I showed you before. And there I want to talk to you about three types of cataract. And the first one, the first cataract I want to show you is a cataract that develops at the anterior aspect of the lens. So you see here, this is the lens material on top of a, on top of cells, which is just more than one layer here is split up and you have here an irregular area. You can imagine that you cannot look through this lens. The reason is most likely for the development of the post, uh, anterior pyramidal, pyramidal cataracts is most likely that at the, at the development of the eye, when the lens loses itself away from the corneal aspect, so from the ectoderm, uh, that material stays with the developing lens and then either connects fully to it or some residual material stays on top of the lens and forms this ectopic tissue or this, this tissue that doesn't belong there. And that is called an anterior pyramidal cataract. Let me go back to the PowerPoint presentation. So we have here a anterior pyramidal cataract. So probably at the lens placode where the future neural retina comes together, forms in, maybe at the time when these areas form, tissue sticks together with this lens 
and then forms a cohesive strand or at least additional tissue that shouldn't be there. Other cataracts are nuclear cataracts. Again, what does cataract mean? Cataract means by waterfall. So the water that normally can be through which you can see perfectly, when it goes through a waterfall, it changes its form and you cannot see through the waterfall. So the same here in the cataract, these are changes where the water clear lens uh, does not allow the light to go through. And in a, a nuclear cataract, what you are losing in the center due to the liquefaction of lens material, you cannot see through that lens. And this, these rings here, you can see this, this uh, lamella material, which is an artifact of the histologic processing of the lens is being lost in the center. And that, way, that is the way how a uh, nuclear, how a liquefaction uh, um, cataract can be diagnosed histologically. Of course, very often we don't see these cases on histology because they are diagnosed through the, um, purely by the, uh, by the clinician. And they don't typically need histologic observation. And then there's the posterior subcapsular cataract that happens when there are residual nucleated fiber, uh, the, uh, nucleated cells from the lens fibers when they are still there in the posterior aspect of the lens and they, they blow up and become very large and so-called bladder, bladder cells and can then accumulate at the posterior aspect of the of the lens and then uh, create a posterior cataract. So cataract, anterior, posterior, and central liquefying cataract. These cataracts can be, of course, removed, as you know, but there are side effects to removing the cataract. The side effects are typically that the endothelium of the cornea is being damaged, either by directly touching it or through other mechanisms. And that can then lead to endothelial damage of the cornea. And that again can lead to stromal edema and epithelial damage. And that then can lead to the necessity that the cornea needs to be replaced as well. We have spoken about the retina and let's go again through the layers. We have the ganglion cell layer, the inner plexiform layer. We have the inner nuclear layer, the outer plexiform layer. We have the outer nuclear layer, the external limiting membrane to the photoreceptors. We have the pigmented retinal epithelium, the Bruch's membrane and the choreocapillaris. So these are the layers we see at the back side of the eye. And different tumors can develop there. So let me show you them first on the slide. So we have here an eye, cornea, lens, iris. And then here we have this lentiform tumor. And here we have the optic nerve. This tumor is pigmented, has more streaming cells. Every time I see that, I have to go back to the book whether it's epithelial or whether this is uh, more spindle cell, I always have to go back to the book. Uh, they are rare enough to see uh, because they are now typically treated by, um, a radi uh, by a radioactive plaque, which is put on top of the sclera. So that is important for me to then look it up every time. But this is a melanoma. And you see that the melanoma is under the Bruch's membrane. This is the pigmented retinal epithelium. And somewhere here is the Bruch's membrane. 
it's under it. It's not the pigmented retinal epithelium that makes the tumor. So let me show you here on the So we have here the pigmented retinal epithelium, the Bruch's membrane, and the melanomas develop from cells at this area of the chorea of the um, of the chorion, and not on top. So we have here an eye with a lesion here. We have here the cornea, the lens, and here is a lesion at the posterior aspect. And you see how it lifts the retina up. Here again, another lesion. Here's the lens, here's the cornea, here's the iris, lens again. And then here's this chocolate dark tumor. And it breaks here through the sclera. Again, the tumor breaks through the sclera here, but not through the Brooks membrane. The retina is lifted up here and the tumor breaks through here in the posterior aspect. And here's the histology of that specimen where the tumor breaks through here on the side. Here, a rare case of a ciliary body melanoma. And then I give you a differential diagnosis because not everything in the, in the eye that is really dark is automatically a melanoma. So there are tumors and they are typically around the optic nerve. They appear very, very, very dark. They are extremely dark and how can we know that these are not malignant? I tell you that, these, uh, that the ophthalmologists have very good ways to differentiate between melanomas and melanocytomas, both through their anatomic location and their appearance macroscopically. These lesions are typically observed and an eye is not being taken out for those lesions. They are very dark. The lesion does not grow over decades then sometimes they can break out and then sometimes they can develop into malignant melanomas, but for a very long time, the eye can be saved. So these are these lesions. Now there's not too much to be seen because this is not bleached. And that's why I'm showing it to you on, on the pictures here. So the lesion here is very close to the nerve, very well circumscribed very dark and extremely compressed. Histologically, one can see, uh, this here is a, a aspiration. One can see large pigmented cells. Here it is bleached and one can see that they are large, but they are no mitotic forms. They are slightly pleomorphic, not severely pleomorphic. And genetically, they look very much like nevi. So melanocytoma is a nevus composed of maximally pigmented plunk, plump polyhedral nevus cells that contain very large melanosomes. The um, tumor is located typically at the inferior uh, temporal aspect of the optic disc and is benign. In 15 to 10 to 15 percent, it may enlarge, and it has a very or the same low malignant potential than any kind of nevus, one to two percent. Uh, histologically, when it becomes malignant, it's characterized by, by development of spindle cells, a spindle shaped melanoma adjacent to typical melanocytoma cells, but it happens infrequently. And the other differential diagnosis is a tumor that can develop from those cells, that's not so fast here. 
So we have here again an, an eye. We have here the posterior aspect. We have the optic nerve, the retina. We have the cornea, the iris, the lens. And here we have in the middle, we have an aspect of a significantly pigmented lesion. And this lesion grows. Again, the ophthalmologists are extremely skilled in telling you where this lesion grows, but it grows on top of the pigmented retinal epithelium. Here, this is the pigmented retinal epithelium. It grows on top of it. Uh, you can imagine that I cannot get the, the perfect section uh, from this teaching set where specifically this lesion has the connection to the pigmented retinal epithelium. But this is a proliferation of the pigmented retinal epithelium. It's not a melanoma. This can grow over a long time, very uh, relatively large. And the eye can again be saved for a long time and observed. And they have, they can become malignant. If they become malignant, only a metas metastasis or severe um, pleomorphism or mitotic forms can define the metastatic potential of these lesions. So again, these lesions develop here from the pigmented retinal epithelium. And you see this patient was observed over eight years and there it grew and became a little more pigmented and this, this eye was removed. And this form here, one can see that the tumor develops here in the area of the pigmented retinal epithelium. With these, some of them have irregular nuclei here and some prominent nucleoli, pigmented cells. The immunohistochemical stains are positive for melanocytic markers, but also strongly positive for CK7, strongly positive for pancytokeratin, EMA, and Vimentin. Again, they can be, they are typically called adenomas. If they are malignant, they are called adenocarcinomas, and the differentiation is invasive growth or the presentation of macrophages. I would like to show you what time is it now? Um, it's uh, seven minutes to the hour. Okay, good. But Let you don't need to hurry. It's all right. Yeah, uh, I have time. <laughs> yeah. Let me. Yes, let me uh, talk a bit about retinoblastoma, and then I'm going to show you two more cases which could be interesting for you. Um, so the retinoblastoma, again, this is a, um, a nine and a half month old uh, patient who has here again, a leukochorion in this eye, you can see that the light is being reflected. And it was diagnosed and there is a subretinal mass with calcification. Calcification is very typical for retinoblastoma. And you see this tumor here, this has the cerebriform gross appearance, fills out the entire eye up to the anterior chamber with free floating tumor cells all over the place. And here's the same section. You see the large areas of necrosis. The tumor grows very fast and cannot sustain its own vasculature. Therefore you see large areas of necrosis. In primitive neuroepithelial cells with rosette formation, prominent apoptotic and mitotic figures, very prominent uh, apoptotic and, my, uh, and uh, mitotic figures also here. And it's basically one of the small blue cell tumors of primitive neuroblastic tissue. The tumor grows out its blood supply and results in large areas of necrosis. 
and retinal differentiation may be present in the form of rosette formation. And then photoreceptor formation can be seen in the form of florette formation. So that's again something you will potentially see, but it would be rare that would go more to a, instead of to a uh, surgical pathologist, that would be more seen in a pediatric neuropathologist. But I would like to show you one more interesting case or two. And the first one is something that one can see now very, very rare. This is a case from the 80s when, uh, or from the early 90s when uh, HIV, systemic uh, infections uh, were very frequent. And there is a patient here who got blind. And we see here in the in the choroid, this accumulation of fungal elements, and this is histoplasma capsulatum. So it's a patient with HIV and histoplasma capsulatum infection. And then another case I want to show you is another granulomatous inflammation you may be see you may be seeing in eyes. And the first one is a patient who has sarcoidosis. And you see here in the eye, again here, the cornea, the iris, the lens, at the area of the nerve, you see here this prominent granulomatous inflammation, negative for infection. Here, these prominent giant cells in a patient who has known to have sarcoidosis. So this is a sarcoidotic eye. But there is a differential diagnosis to granulomatous inflammation of the eye. And I show you that in one second. So what happens if an eye is being damaged by an accident, for example, or by trauma, is that is that material from the eye will enter the blood circulation and the eye is not exposed to the immune system. And this material will then elicit an immunologic reaction um, to the other eye, which is still there, which is called a sympathetic ophthalmopathy. That is the reason why an, a traumatic eye is relatively fast removed so that this sympathetic ophthalmopathy is not happening. So sympathetic ophthalmopathy is now that the other eye suffers with the first eye, but in this case, a immunologic damage. And what one can see here is inflammation Again, typically it starts in the area of the sclera with acute, mostly, mostly chronic inflammation, a bit acute inflammation, chronic inflammation. I don't know exactly where they are here. I see some pigment. So we could here be in the area of the ciliary apparatus. Potentially it's entirely phthitic eye. So the eye is being fully destroyed, but it looks a bit as if we were here in the area of the ciliary apparatus, and one can again see areas. I don't think these are giant cells here. These are probably surface epithelial cells of the ciliary apparatus, but these, this inflammation can also become granulomatous. The differential diagnosis here is also development of lymphoma. So either lymphoma or, of course, the history will tell you, but, uh, this kind of histologic picture could also be seen in, uh, in a lymphoma. In this case, it's, an, it's a sympathetic ophthalmopathy. Again, caused by an immunologic reaction to the remaining eye after a traumatic eye has elicited an antigen antibody reaction. So what, I'm, what I tried to do is I tried to show you a couple of cases in ophthalmic pathology, which one could see as a practicing pathologist, a surgical pathologist. 
This does not go into the minutiae of specific tumors and specific um, ophthalmic syndromes, but more into the areas what we can expect when we see an, an eye specimen um, to make sure that at least we have an idea what kind of pathology could be happening there. I would otherwise now stop here. And if there are any questions, you let me know. Thank you so much, Dr. Vogt, for this excellent talk on ophthalmic pathology. So Dr. Vogt, you can turn on your video now. And uh, there are a few questions that I can see online. Let me read them to you. Um, the first question is about Zion cell arthritis. So the question is like this. Um, so regarding Zion cell arthritis, many times clinician already treated patient with steroid and did the biopsy after treatment. So will the histologic finding look quite normal in such a situation? So what I have tried to do is I showed you one case where a patient was treated for two weeks and then a biopsy was performed and it is very difficult. I have to tell you, it's very difficult. And there is one single paper. Uh, if you um, don't know by whom that is, um, can't, I forgot uh, who, who published that. There's one paper where there was a tiny study, maybe 15 patients. Again, what you need to find is potentially accumulation of macrophages within the wall of the artery and or residual CD3 positive T cells. If you can see that, then you can at least have an educated guess and you say, this is what I'm seeing. And that is compatible with a treated uh, giant cell arteritis. But in order to make the diagnosis, the biopsy should be done first. Then the patient is immediately put on, on, uh, on treatment. And then you wait two, three days maximum until you get your uh, biopsy back. Then nothing bad has been done with the, uh, with the steroid treatment and it could be interrupted. I don't think they can do it immediately, but maybe over three, four days. Um, and if it stays, and if the biopsy comes out to be positive, then the patient is already treated and can stay on treatment. Thank you. There is another question from the same uh, viewer. The question is, uh, again, regarding the cell arthritis, I think this is a very practical problem for everybody. Uh, the question is, I couldn't find any Zion cell and the inflammation was limited. I did the elastic stain and found the fragmentation of elastin. Should I assume as treated Zion cell arthritis or should not? So again, I think this is something we see all the time. Uh, the elastic stain, I usually don't do an elastic stain um, because very frequently, these are typically elderly patients, and very frequently one sees some fragmentation of the elastica, lamina elastica interna, uh, even in patients who have nothing or they have um, bit calcification. I don't find it too helpful. Uh, inflammation can sometimes be very mild. Um, it is sometimes only seen in the adventitia with bit of percolation of cells into the media. I report it as is. So what I would say in a case in a patient where there is a very mild infiltrate, uh, lympho lymphocellular infiltrate around the temporal artery with a little percolating into the into the media, I would say. Um, muscular artery with mild perivascular adventitial infiltrate with mild involvement of the media. And then I would say in the uh, no giant cells identified in the correct, in the correct media uh, medical circumstances, this can be, mm -hmm. this can be associated with uh, temporal arteriitis. Right. I think that's a very practical uh, question for everybody. Like uh, another uh, viewer wants to know 
which I think you have already answered is that what is your threshold to call it giant cell arthritis? When you get a biopsy and you don't find giant cells and, uh, and the clinician is suspecting that there is giant cell arthritis, so how far do you go or like uh, is your so, threshold? Yeah, I really call it giant cell arteritis only when I see a giant cells. And if I don't see a giant cell, I call it temporal arteritis. <laughs> a little trick around, but again, the same, the, the same answer. If you don't see giant cells, but it's inflamed, then just call it uh, temporal arteritis. Uh, giant cells can be there, but they don't have to be there. Um, and again, if the infiltrate is very mild, but it's there, you have to report it. And, uh, and if you call it negative, although there's an infiltrate, um, then you can run into a problem if the patient gets too early off of steroids and develop blindness. I would not feel too happy about that as a, as a pathologist. So um, you, then you have to say, you know, does the patient have the right symptomatic uh, for the disease? Did the patient get better after the steroid treatment? Um, so that the diagnosis at the end is a clinical pathological diagnosis and you, you do the best we do the best we can. So it seems like that it's very important to communicate with the treating physician all the time when you have such a biopsy and uh, let them know and discuss it. Is that correct? I actually call every biopsy. I call the positives, definitely, but I also call the negatives because again, if it is negative and the, and the physician says, you know, that is, I, I cannot imagine anything else then what I would do is I would potentially even go back and get more levels. These things can have skip lesions. And then otherwise say, maybe you want to biopsy the other side. Um, maybe you didn't take a long enough biopsy. Uh, maybe you want to go back. And if, if, the, if the physician wants to go back, then they need to go back fast because the patient is already treated. But our turnaround time is usually next day, so one should see, still see good damage if there is damage. Right, right. Thank you. And uh, so one last question on the same line is that how long do you expect the giant cells to be gone after steroid treatment in giant cell arthritis? Okay, that is the same question uh, of what can I do on a patient who has who has been treated. That is, it's really not known. There is this one. There's one publication, from, but I can't remember who it was. <laughs> one publication, if you put it into, into one of the uh, uh, surge engines and you go treat it, temporal arteritis and histopathology, you should find it. Um, uh, it is a very small publication, and um, but I couldn't find much more on that subject. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh we can go to the next question. So uh, this question is about uh, uveal melanoma, that how frequently do you send uveal melanomas for GNAC mutation? Does it have any prognostic value? Okay, so um, if melanomas are being taken out, I automatically send them to, the, uh, to our molecular pathology department um, who will then set up the necessary, the, ne the necessary um, molecular tests, which the clinicians uh, request. Um, I, I do not personally perform or read those, uh, read those tests. So I would refer to the, um, to the publications on that, please. All right. And I think there is another question of which is the similar. How do you differentiate primary uveal melanomas from distant occult metastasis? Uh, so the primary melanomas typically grow in the in the in the sclera as a single lesion, morphologically, uh, very typically, um, also macroscopically typical. So the most, most of, uh, I think I have seen twice a metastasis of a melanoma into the eye. And both of them were teaching cases. So I personally haven't seen them. And both of those cases were diagnosed as metastatic lesions by the clinicians from, by the way, 
how the lesions presented clinically and in the, um, in the ophthalmic view. Right. Um, and then theoretically, one probably can go through different genetic tests. Uh, ophthalmic melanomas are genetically different from, uh, from skin melanomas, typically. Uh, this question is also similar. That, uh, you talked about melanocytoma. Uh, how practically, you know, like you actually differentiate melanocytoma and melanoma? Is it a very hard diagnosis to differentiate between the two? Uh, typically not, because the of I cannot I cannot emphasize the skills of ophthalmologists. The ophthalmologist will diagnose it and it will come with a diagnosis and you will be, it will be very, very, in very rare cases, will you, um, will it be necessary to reverse a diagnosis from a melanocytoma to a melanoma? Uh, typically what you need to do, if it comes to your desk, of course you need to bleach it. You do a KI67, which should be almost negative in a melanocytoma. Um, and the, um, the cells are ve uh, very large, uh, not very atypical, and the melanomas that develop out of melanocytoma are typically spindle cell melanomas. And again, I have seen one, cases, one case which was produced by uh, Jerry Shields at Wills Eye Institute in, uh, I think it was 2013, uh, as one of the rare cases where he found a, a melanoma case developing out of a melanocytoma. All right, yeah, because these are rare lesions, so you know, I mean, not everybody gets an opportunity to see them in practice. Now, thank you for sharing your experience, Dr. Fogt. And uh, one of our colleagues uh, actually wants to know what solution do you use for melanin bleaching, Dr. Fogt? Uh. <laughs> a difficult question. I, I call the lab and say, please bleach. <laughs> we will have to find that uh, answer from our uh, lab and then get yeah. back to our. Yeah, I came back. I came back. I came back. Uh, came right. back to you, Dr. Manan, and uh, maybe you can post it then on the. Uh, on sure. The, on the we yeah, we can do that. Yeah, this is a question about uh, cataracts. So, and uh, what's the significance of submitting the lens for pathology after cataract surgery? Because our ophthalmologists do not. Yeah, uh, this what I I described it so that we have an idea what kind of I I gave you um, I gave what I wanted to do is I wanted to give the audience uh, three examples of cataracts and how they would present if you would have one, uh, but you are entirely right, uh, cataracts are not being submitted uh, to surgical pathology, but it is, um, I, I found it uh, potentially necessary or at least entertaining to see how a cataract looks, uh, how diff three different types of cataracts look under the microscope. But the, uh, the person who asked the question is absolutely right. Uh, it will not be sent uh, for pathology and you don't have to make a diagnosis. Right. Thank you again. Uh, I think these all are the questions that I found online on both uh, YouTube and Facebook. And uh, our viewers are very thankful. So uh, the question on Zion cell arthritis uh, uh, was coming from Thailand and uh, Dr. Jarukit, I think I pronounced his name correctly. So he says that your answer will be very helpful and how to report, uh, he will find it very useful in his practice. And uh, so Dr. Folk, you would be happy to know that there were a couple of hundred viewers who joined for this lecture online from different countries. And I could see that there were viewers who joined from uh, Zambia, Costa Rica, Algeria, Tanzania, Guatemala, and uh, your previous fellow Ali also joined from New Jersey. I could see him online. Thanks to Ali for joining. And uh, so thank you, Dr. Folk, for this excellent talk. And uh, for our viewers, thank you for your support. And uh, if you 
like our lecture so you don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel that is patchcast and also follow the facebook page where you can find all the lectures and you can also uh, visit our website that is pathologycast.com where all the lectures are archived so i mean they are organized by some specialty so uh, you can watch them there and our next lecture is coming up on 5th of 10th of may sorry and that would be on cns pathology and dr fausto rodriguez from ucla will continue the third talk on the 2021 who update of cns tumors and he would be discussing about ependymomas and uh, what's the new classification talking about ependymomas so hope to see you then and stay tuned and uh, thank you all and thank you again dr folk for your thank time thank you very much it was an honor to talk to so many people thank you have a wonderful day